Hi everyone, um, I just wanted to say welcome. Um, now if we can just get a sound check um, to make sure everyone can hear. Um, I didn't do that last time and we had some technical issues. So if everyone can just in the, um, in the question box um, just type if they can hear me. Um, just so that we know we are live. Oh yes, loud and clear, perfect. Okay, that's Nadine, I think. So beautiful. Okay, um, so I will just give everyone a few more seconds. We've just got quite a few jumping on now, so I don't want everyone to miss anything. Um, hopefully everyone is comfortable and ready for a very informative night. Um, we have Kate again from um, uh, Happy Horse Sports Therapy who has willingly volunteered to cover this topic which is fantastic because it stops me um, having to research it. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, so I'll just, uh, while well, we've still got a few more people hopping on, um, I'll just introduce Kate. So Kate um, started Happy Horse Sports Therapy in our region um, in uh, four years ago. Uh, and I like to explain Kate uh, as a, she's really like an osteopath. So she's not a chiropractor, she's not a massage therapist, um, she's not a Bowen therapist, um, but she uses a lot of modalities and works with the whole horse, not just um, the skeletal system or the muscular system. So um, it's a sort of a holistic approach on problems that your horse um, has, uh, particularly lamenesses and things like that. So um, Kate is Australian qualified. Um, and the thing I really like about Kate is when she comes to your horse, she actually gives you homework. And I don't know if any of you have ever been to a chiropractor or a physio, but they always send you home with homework. So. Um, that's uh, that's fantastic. So, without any further ado, I will now. Kate is just scoffing down the rest of her dinner. Um, she's she's had to come straight from calls to um, to us, so she's um, just grabbing something to eat quickly. Um, so I will pass her over, and we'll go from there. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Louise. Um, just excuse me while I swallow that last mouthful. Uh, welcome everybody to Saddle Fitting from an anatomical and biomechanical perspective. Thank you very much to Louise and exclusively Equine Bets for inviting me to participate today. And I just wanted to say at the very beginning that I do have a photo of a very skinny horse and also some dissection photos coming up in the presentation. So um, if you're a little bit squeamish or a little bit sensitive to those things, I'll let you know when they're about to pop up on your screen and you can mute, minimise or uh, look away or, or do whatever you need to do. Okay, so what we'll cover today is the horse's back and where the rider's weight needs to be, why the saddle should fit the horse biomechanically and what can happen when it doesn't, how to tell if your saddle fits or not and what to do if it doesn't fit. So what can we as horse owners rather than trained saddle fit experts do to assess our saddle's fit and therefore ensure our horse is comfortable when we ride it? So we'll cover um, the biomechanics of the horse's back, so the way this, the muscles and, and the skeleton all fit together and what happens when we put weight onto that structure. Um, we'll also talk about how to assess your saddle's fit, anatomically speaking, to your horse's back specifically, and then what you can do to improve the fit of the saddle if it's almost there but not quite right. So. Um, with saddle fitters versus a biomechanical assessment. So I'm a body worker by trade and all of my qualifications have been around body work. As Louise was saying, I look at the whole horse and I see a lot of horses that have back issues and so that has led me into the saddle fitting side of things. So most experts recommend that a saddle fit is checked every six months or so and this is because the shape of your horse's back changes the same way humans change with their weight. So as the shape of the horse's back changes, be that through diet, workload, the seasons, um, disciplines, hoof balance, teeth, muscular issues, any previous injuries, saddle fit, age, etc. So should the way that your saddle fits to your horse's back. So um, a saddle that fit a green broken two-year-old likely won't fit your horse when he's a seven-year-old two-star eventer and that same saddle also won't fit him when he's 30-year-old 30, 30 and sway back. 
So just as humans grow and develop as they age and change their activities, so too does your horse. Um, and a good way of looking at it is, would you wear shoes that are two sizes too small or too big? Would you wear the same pants now as what you did when you were 12 years old? Or would you walk a long distance with a rock in your shoe? And that's how the horse would feel being ridden in a saddle that doesn't quite fit. So this is the photo of my skinny horse. And I've chosen this photo because he is very underweight and it's easy to see the landmarks I'm referring to. But this guy is okay. He was given a course of steroids and we brought him back to health. Um, so he no longer looks like this. But the five important areas to look at with regards to saddle fit are the withers, the scapula, the trapezius muscles, kind of up there, <laughs> yeah, the ribs, and the paraspinal ligaments and spine, which run along the top. So when we look at the horse, we'll um, talk about the withers first. So the most common saddle fitting issue is when the saddle touches the withers. The, with the saddle should never make contact with the withers or the spine at all. Um, it can cause pain through rubbing and also joint issues along the spine because there's a joint in between each vertebrae of the spine. We get white hairs where the pigment cells have died and if you're looking at the horse on the left, the chestnut, note the difference in shoulders to the left and right of the withers. So the left shoulder is sitting a lot higher and it's a, a slope whereas the right shoulder is sitting a lot lower and it's like a down and out. Um, so that horse is not evenly muscled over the shoulders. So that leads us onto the scapula. So did you know that most horses are left-handed? Dr. Joanna Robson from the UK states that roughly 80% of horses have bigger shoulder muscles on the left-hand side. Now question, do saddle makers make saddles evenly or do they make them for horses with big left shoulders? Every time we look at a saddle, it's made evenly, 50-50 on both sides. And that's because when we ride our horse, we want them to be even. We want them to be ambidextrous. We want them to go just as well to the left as what they go to the right. But then when you put an evenly made saddle onto your left shoulder big horse, what happens? It gets too tight on the left hand side. It then falls over to the right hand side, causes twisting over the spine and therefore discomfort. If it's not rectified, you can have a horse who no longer wants to canter to the left falls in on a circle, bucks and displays bad behaviour. So uh, this is part of the reason why saddle fit is so important. We can see these physical signs of ill-fitting saddles just by looking at our horse's musculature and also the pigmentation of the hair. White hair over the withers or in the saddle fitting area indicates too much pressure. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So these are our graphic dissection pics. I probably should have given you warning before, <laughs> before we moved on. Um, look away if you're, if you're queasy. So the scapula is covered in cartilage. The picture on the left, we've got um, some of the muscles, infraspinatus and supraspinatus that sit on top of the scapula have been removed. So we can see the spine of scapula here and the actual scapula itself coming down to the shoulder joint. Um, so the scapula is covered in cartilage which sits at the top next to the withers. If we look at the photo in the middle, we've got scapular cartilage around the top of the scapula. So the spine of scapula that you can see in the photo on the left uh, marries up with the spine of scapula in the photo in the middle here. So the scapular cartilage is at the top of the scapula and most saddles, if the saddle tree is too narrow, then the points can pinch in this area and the cartilage will begin to get worn away. Now the dissection pick pics of this horse is from Dusty who was a nine-year-old raced thoroughbred gelding and the gouge in the scapula in this middle photo is where the saddle tree was connecting with the scapula cartilage when he was ridden. So as the horse's leg comes forward the scapula goes back and then when the horse's leg comes back the scapula moves forward. So every time Dusty took a step forward the scapula would rotate back and the scapula cartilage would hit the saddle tree and then we got this gouged little bit of cartilage in the scapula here. So most saddles are fitted to horses standing still but when a horse lifts a leg the scapula moves and a saddle that fits the horse when it's stationary may not may no longer fit when it's in motion. So even if you fit 
the saddle to the horse when it's standing still, you look at it and go, yep, that's perfect, he's got room, he can move. But then if you walk him out and he's got a big stride and the scapula hits the tree of the saddle, you can end up with damage to the scapula cartilage. So the cartilage itself is quite um, soft in comparison to bone. In the photo on the right, where I'm holding the scapula, you can see that the top bit there is quite um, pliable, it, it's soft and I can bend it backwards and forwards. So it's very easy for a metal um, tree to damage the soft cartilage of the scapula. Okay, let's move on to the next one. We're still on dissection photos, folks. So now we're going to talk about the trapezius muscle. So the trapezius muscle comes in two sections, the cervicus portion over the neck and the thoracic portion over the withers. The function of the trapezius muscle is to elevate the scapula and draw the shoulder forward. And so the gullet is sitting right on the traps. So if you have a saddle that's too tight in the gullet and is pinching the trapezius, it will cause atrophy in this muscle which will extend up the neck. So if you look at your horse and he has a dip in front of the withers, uh, consider the gullet of the saddle that the horse is ridden in because it's likely affecting this trapezius muscle. There's also cranial nerve 11, which is also called the accessory spinal nerve, and the spinal thoracic nerves in the trapezius muscle, which provide motor function to the muscle. So when these muscles are stimulated, they cause the horse to lift its head, hollow the back, and flatten the croup. And this is, this is the opposite of what we want when we're riding the horse. We want him to lower the head lift the back and round the hindquarters. So if the saddle is stimulating these nerves constantly, the entire time you're riding, it's going to be impossible for the horse to lower the head, lift the back and work in true self-carriage, which is what we're asking the horse to do when he's on the saddle. Um, now let me just see if there's a little bit more on the trapezius that I wanted to talk about. Oh yes, so over 50 million years of equine evolution has seen the stallion biting its opponents in the wither area to determine dominance and literally bring rivals to their knees. So stallions will also bite mares here to stop them moving forward so that they can mount them safely. And the reflex point in this wither, wither area is that cranial nerve 11. Pinching gullet plates, lunging girths, vaulting girths, driving harnesses will all achieve the same result as the stallions bite acting upon the muscles in the wither region like a vice grip. And so this nerve, cranial nerve 11, signals to the brain that the movement in the upper arm and shoulder blade needs to be blocked. The longissimus muscle then contracts, which in turn drops the horse's back. And then being ridden with a hollowed back encourages the vertebrae to fall into each other. And that's when you get issues like kissing spine syndrome. Then the pelvis will rotate forward and open as a result in, of further contraction of the longissimus muscle. The longissimus muscle runs from the neck right along the spine to the pelvis. So um, having the muscle impacted at the front of the horse gives us issues at the back of the horse. Um, so the sum of the chain reactions then results in reflexive immobility for the horse. And then we're sitting on the horse saying move forward, but because of this nerve impingement, the horse physically isn't able to move forward. So that's why the trapezius muscle is so important to consider when we're looking at saddle fit and why having um, wide enough gullet, a wide enough gullet in your saddle is so important. Okay, next one. I feel a lot more confident this time. <laughs> My first one, I was so nervous. This one, I feel like I've got it all together. Okay, so now we're going to look at the horse and his sp the paraspinal ligaments and the spine. So there are ligaments that sit either side of the top of the thoracic vertebrae, which is the spine. So the horse on the left, we've got the pelvis on the far left, and then the spine and the withers, and then the shoulder blade is up the top, but we've taken this, the shoulder blade off this dissection. Um, and then you can see that the spring of the ribs as well. So this, where the ribs come out, this is the shelf of the ribs, which is also important in saddle fitting. So the dissection picture in the middle, we're looking at, if you tilt your head to the left, you can sort of get it. We're looking at the spine and then the ribs. And so we're in between the spine and the ribs. That's where we have, it's been removed now, but that's where we have um, deep muscles like multifidus and also the paraspinal ligaments. So. The spine is what supports the body and each thoracic process, which is each spinal vertebrae, 
has a small amount of movement between them and it and the function was never to support the weight of a rider. Uh, horses are flight animals and they're taught they're built for speed and, and they, they need to run. Um, they were never designed by nature to be weight bearing. So humans decided, oh here's this animal, it looks nice and placid, I reckon I could sit on that back and then it became a ridden animal. So the saddle needs to sit on muscles, not ligaments or spine. It's the muscles that will support your saddle and the weight. Pressure on the ligaments and the spine can cause fluid pockets, restriction of back movement, inflammation and pain. So the channel, it's very important that the channel of the saddle is wide enough at least to clear the spine and the ligaments and in some horses this can be up to four or five fingers wide. So if you you put your saddle down on the cantle and you look at the underside of the saddle where the two panels are and just measure with your hand how wide your channel is. If it's a fairly old saddle, chances are it will only be two fingers wide which is very narrow and your panels will be impacting the uh, paraspinal ligaments and the spine. When the horse turns a corner, um, that's when you'll really see that the saddle will shift and that's when you'll get pressure right on the spine if the channel isn't wide enough. So kissing spines, which I mentioned earlier, is where the spinous processes through the back rub together and that is very painful. Um, if, if you have arthritis then you'll, you'll know the feeling. It's bone on bone and it's really not a pleasant feeling. Kissing spines can be diagnosed by a vet through x-rays. Yeah, is it x-rays? Louise is nodding at me. X-rays. So now we'll move on to the weight bearing area. So, um, uh, so because of how the horse's back is built and the structures that we've spoken about previously, the saddle can only sit over certain structures. Training the horse to work correctly over the back and use these muscles in a supportive way is paramount for correct biomechanics. So that means we really want the horse to lift their back up into the saddle to support the weight of the rider. So to identify the weight bearing area of your horse's back, you need to find the back of the scapula, which is our first line there. And then we lift the foreleg and the scapula rotates back and then we find the new back of the scapula. So that's where the horse's leg comes to when it's trotting and moving. So the scapula rotates forwards and back as the forelimb goes backwards and forwards. We then need to find the shelf of the ribs, which we spoke about in our dissection photo, um, which if you start up the top where the mouse was first and then use your fingers to feel down, you'll hit the shelf of the ribs and it feels bony. You can feel the change between muscle and bone and that's where the ribs are springing out from the spine. And then we find the last rib and we follow the curve up to the spine. And then we feel along the top, we feel the, the springiness of the ligaments and we come down off the spine and the ligaments and that's our top border. So the rectangle that we have in the middle there is the weight bearing area of the horse's back. Um, I like to use liquid chalk or chalk that's been soaked in water to draw the weight bearing area on the horse's back and then put my saddle on top and have a look at where the panels are sitting to make sure that I'm within the border. So if the saddle doesn't fit properly, we can get a lot of pain, bad behaviour, we can restrict movement through the body and affect muscle development. Being an equine body worker, I see a lot of horses with sore backs and compromised hind quarter movement and in more cases than not, it's from being ridden in a saddle that doesn't fit properly. When a horse is sore, they usually tell us with bad behaviour, things like pinning the ears, girthiness, bucking, rearing, pig rooting, reluctance to move forward, just general unhappiness under saddle. They might pin their ears back when they see the saddle come out. They might fidget when you try to do up the girth. Riding in a saddle that correctly fits your horse's back is paramount if you aim to get the best from your horse. A well-fitting saddle is what helps to promote free movement, comfort, muscle development and a happier horse. So some symptoms of ill-fitting saddles. There's lots. <laughs> We've got anxiety, things like wide eyes, tight mouth, hollow back, ducking away from the saddle, fidgeting, frequent chewing, stress-like behaviours. We can get muscle atrophy in the back, shoulders wither or the base of the neck. Um, we can have bad tempers, a change in behaviour when the saddle's brought into sight, bucking and rearing, cold back 
um, a cold back is when the horse is touchy when he's first mounted, but then he works out of it, um, or if he's if flinchy in general. We can have changes in performance, things like not going forwards, not flexing properly, not picking up the correct canter lead. If you pull your saddle off after a ride and there's dry spots, that's usually indicative of, ex of excessive pressure. Um, this is because the sweat pores aren't functioning uh, because there's too much pressure on the area. So the sweat pores can't come through and that's why you get dry spots. It can also happen if there's no contact. So if there's no pressure, then there's no sweat. So dry spots are tricky. It's, they, they can be caused by both too much pressure and too little pressure. Um, there's also uh, granulomas, and I'm going to look to the vet as to how to pronounce that first word. Ooh, hang on, hang on, she needs the microphone. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> They're called eosinophilic granulomas. <laughs> I like to just say that it's a buildup of collagen that can be caused by excessive rubbing, among other things, and they're often caused, uh, often accompanied by swelling as well. Um, because I can't pronounce that first word and I'm not a vet, I just say, feels like it could be a granuloma, and then I say, if you want a proper diagnosis, you should call a vet. Um, we can also get girthiness, things like pinning the ears, biting, kicking, ducking when the girth is tightened up. And of course, as we saw earlier, white hairs where excessive pressure has affected the pigmentation of the hair. Okay, so then we look at the saddle. If we're looking at, to see how well our saddle fits, we assess the horse. So we look at all of the structures of the horse that we've talked about so far, withers, scapula, etc. We look at the symmetry of the horse, especially over the withers and the shoulders. Uh, we know that most shoulders are going to be bigger on the left side, left shoulder than the right. And then we feel the horse for any sore areas. We then look at the saddle off the horse. So we're evaluating the saddle itself, looking to see if there's any twists in the tree, um, if it's even, etc. Then we look at the saddle on the horse. Then we look at the saddle with a rider in it, because of course you don't put the saddle on and then not add the rider as well. And then we watch the saddle whilst the horse is in motion because the way the rider rides can also impact the way the saddle is fitting the horse. So after we've assessed the horse, we then assess the saddle. I don't need that, that's fine. Uh, so we look at the saddle. Is it straight? Is it even? We look at the tree, the channel width, the stirrup bar and the girth alignment. We look for any wear or damage. We check the evenness of panels and we feel the flocking in the panels. So this saddle on the left is one that I dissected. And we can clearly see in the top photo, the left panel is very flat, whereas the right panel is very bulgy. So it, you can see right there that the panels are completely different shapes. One is long and flat and one is quite round. And they are also completely different sizes. Uh, this is also a saddle, a fairly old one, where the channel gets narrower the further back you get. I could only get one and a half fingers at the back there. And as we spoke about earlier, to clear the spine and the paraspinal ligaments, some horses will need three, four, maybe even five fingers. So a saddle that has a really wide channel is imperative. Quite often, the older saddles will narrow at the back and that's really what you don't need because that just puts a little bit of extra pressure over the thoracolumbar junction. And that's where the back of the rib cage becomes lumbar vertebrae and there's a joint there that actually needs to move. So if you put your saddle or any weight on that joint, then you block it and the horse can't use his hindquarters properly. Um, we are also, what are we looking at here? Oh yeah, these should be video clips. This is going to be interesting. We'll see if they play. Okay, so this, I don't know if I talk or not. Oh, I do talk. Okay. We might not be getting sound. Okay, let's play that again, just in case we don't have sound and I will repeat what I say in my video. Okay, so this is a tree out of a Wintech saddle. The tree isn't even, it rocks from side to side. Note that it's lifted at the front and when we make it level at the front, it's lifted at the back. So this is a Wintech Pro Dressage saddle and it wasn't even that old. So the saddle on the right, 
uh, that's from a, I'm pretty sure that one, no, that's the same saddle. It's the photos on the left. That is the Kruger New Zealand 1993 dressage saddle. So that's um, evaluating the saddle. Please, if you've got any questions, should we hold them to the end? Oh, type them in and we'll address them all at the end. I do feel like I'm whizzing through this quite quickly, um, but I think it's because. I love this picture. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I'm whizzing through it very quickly, but I think it's because no one's talking back to me. Louise has just said how much she loves the picture of the Palomino on the left and that she sees a lot of this in her practice. <laughs> so <laughs> looking at this photo, um, we can see that the saddle is clearly not in the weight-bearing area that we have talked about <laughs> of this horse. This saddle is right up over the withers, right up over the scapula. <laughs> sitting up on the neck of the horse, this poor horse, I don't even know how it's managing to canter. Um, so we put the saddle on the horse and we look at where the saddle is sitting on the horse. It must be within the weight-bearing area that we've spoken about earlier. This first big <laughs> saddle is way too far forward. The saddle um, on the, the, the picture of the three saddles in the middle, so the first one is balanced and you can see the way the, the centre of gravity of the saddle changes as it's tilted back or forwards. So ideally we want the rider's weight in the centre of the saddle. Looking at the photo on the right, you can see the saddle is sitting evenly. So it's not about lining up the cantle to the pommel, it's about lining up where the rider's weight will sit so that the rider's weight is in the middle of the saddle. So, we need to check if the saddle is balanced and centred. Is it tipping forwards or backwards? Check that the centre of the saddle is parallel to the ground. And if you don't have a balanced saddle, then you as a rider will be unbalanced and the horse will experience back pain. And all I want to do is yank that saddle back on the palomino into the weight-bearing area. Okay, so we're still looking at the saddle here. Is there with a clearance and is the gullet channel width suitable? So. This, there's a good, we put the saddle on the horse and we look at the front and there's a good three fingers in this picture on the left. You should be able to fit three to four fingers in the gullet over the withers. If you can fit more than four fingers, then the gullet is too narrow and the saddle is sitting perched up too high, which is going to restrict the movement of the scapula. If you can fit less than three fingers, then the gullet is too wide and the saddle is sitting too low over the withers and it's likely going to be impinging the withers and the spinous processes themselves. So is there room for the shoulder to move back under the saddle when the horse brings his leg forward? Can you fit two to three fingers all around the wither, not just on the top? And if you don't have this, then the horse will get pinched in his wither and shoulder area. So the saddle in the middle is one that only has a two finger channel width, which as we've spoken about is unlikely to be wide enough to clear the spine and the paraspinal ligaments of the back. And then the saddle on far right, you can fit a whole hand through that channel. It's really got a good four to five fingers width. And that's a good saddle, particularly for a, um, a big heavy horse. That's what something that you need because the bigger the horse, the bigger the bones, the bigger the ligaments. So we really need something that will clear that sensitive area for the horse. Okay. Now evaluating the saddle. So we put the saddle on the horse and the girth points should be hanging perpendicular to the ground. Oh, hang on, I think I've dropped ahead. I have to, nope, we're talking about full panel contact. So we put the saddle on the horse. Are there areas where the saddle is not making contact but it should be? So at the back we can fit two fingers here. Oh, I have such nice nail polish in that photo. <laughs> So the saddle, this one that Louise has the mouse on now, the saddle is sitting quite nicely over the scapula but it's lifted at the back. You can also see that it's sitting on the right side of the back but not the left because on the left I can get my hand underneath that panel. Um, we're looking at even pressure throughout. We're looking at the back of the saddle to see if the panels are flat against the horse's back and we rock the saddle to see if it moves. So Bridging is where there's pressure or contact at the front of the saddle and at the back of the saddle, but not through the middle. So you can often tell if it's bridging by peeking up to see if you can see daylight, 
or running your fingers underneath the saddle and feeling the evenness of the saddle contact onto the horse's back. This horse on the right, who I really feel sorry for, has been ridden in a saddle that bridges for a very long time and you can see he's got pressure points at the front by the side of the withers and pressure points at the back. So his saddle ideally would have full panel contact all the way from the front to the back. Okay, now we're going to talk about girth points. So we're looking at where the girth points hang. The girth points should hang perpendicular to the ground. Girth points that pull forward, as in the first photo, can cause damage to the scapular cartilage because the girth is fixed in the girth groove behind the elbow and when you add the rider's weight it can pull the saddle forward up over the shoulders. And so that's when we really risk the trees damaging the scapular cartilage as we saw in the dissection photo earlier. Um, the girth points that hang back can pinch the elbow and cause damage that way. Um, the correct position for a girth is vertically beneath the saddle, so what, just where it hangs. It should be no less than five inches behind the elbow if we want to avoid discomfort. And to loop the girth forward to lay in the so-called girth groove will have the effect of pulling the saddle forward. So we don't want to fit the girth and then fit the saddle and have the two not marry up. A well-fitting saddle will have the girth points sitting nicely right where the girth groove is. Yeah, good. So, is the saddle too long for the back? This is one that I see all the time. It's probably, other than the withers touching the saddle, this is probably about on par, if not more frequent. So, as I spoke about before, there's a joint between each vertebrae and there's a joint at the back of the last rib that becomes the lumbar. And then if we put weight over this joint, then it restricts the movement of the back and the horse can't move his hindquarters properly. So is the saddle too long? Well, think about our uh, weight-bearing area. Is it extending past the last rib? If yes, then the saddle is too long. The saddle should fit along the length of the back, which is measured from the back of the scapula to the last rib. If the, if the saddle is too long, then the horse will experience a large amount of lower back pain and might have issues such as running through the hands, a four-beat canter, or bucking. So the size of the saddle isn't the size of the rider's butt, as I always thought it was, but it's actually the length of the femur. So if you're short, then you would need a 15-inch saddle, and if you're tall, then you would need an 18-inch saddle. So it, the, the sizing of saddles isn't to do with how heavy the rider is, it's to do with the length of the femur. And the femur runs from the hip joint to our knee. So measure that <laughs> and then see what size saddle you need. <laughs> In the first picture, the saddle is clearly too long because the skirts of the saddle goes right back to the tuber coxy. So some people, the tuber coxy is the point of hip, which is a bony landmark that you can feel of the pelvis. So some people might look at this saddle and say, oh, but the seat is more forward of the skirt. That doesn't matter because the skirt is still going to be impinging on the tuber coxy or, or digging into the lumbar muscles of the horse and still causing pain. Um, also, when the rider sits in the saddle and then puts their weight back as they ask for a canter or as they're chasing a cow if they lose their balance, then that's going to put all of the rider's weight back over that really sensitive lumbar area of the horse. So this saddle on this horse is way too long. We can also see that the horse is struggling being ridden in this saddle by looking at the super overdeveloped shoulders and the super underdeveloped hindquarters. So when we look at a horse, we want him to be evenly muscled through the neck, the shoulders, the back and the hindquarters. And looking at this photo, we can clearly see that the hindquarters look like they belong to a lean thoroughbred, whereas the shoulders look like they belong to a really solid quarter horse or Clydesdale or something huge. So they don't look like they belong to the same horse and this is because the saddle the horse is being ridden in is putting pressure over the muscles, particularly the middle gluteal tongue, the lumbar muscles and the muscles that activate the hind quarter. So, so this horse is physically unable to use his hind quarter properly and bring his legs underneath him, which means he's taking all of his weight through the forehand and that's why we've got super developed shoulder muscles and underdeveloped hindquarter muscles. 
So we also want to check that the saddle sits straight on the horse's back. As we spoke about earlier, some horses, most horses, are bigger on one side than the other, so left shoulder big or right shoulder big. So we want to look at the saddle from behind to make sure the middle of the cantle aligns with the middle of the spine. If the saddle isn't straight, then the rider can't be straight. And this can also cause sacroiliac issues in horses. So if the horse is predominantly shoulder big, like obviously shoulder big on one side, then chances are when he moves, he's going to tip the saddle so that it's not straight. So we have some work to do with the horse to make him even through both shoulders. And that's where the bodywork component comes in and, and exercises to strengthen the horse and to help him use the correct muscles. We don't then go out and get a saddle especially made to fit him that has more build or is more built up over the right shoulder and less built up over the left shoulder um, to suit a left shoulder big horse because that doesn't teach the horse to move straight. It just keeps the saddle straight on a crooked horse. But what we want to do is have a straight saddle on a straight horse. So uh, saddles are made evenly and we need to work our horses evenly. So if the horse is left shoulder big, then that's when we need to enlist the help of a vet or a body worker or another equine professional, look at feet, at hoof balance, look at uh, the biomechanics of the horse and work on how to improve the musculature of the right shoulder and stop the horse from being so left shoulder dominant. So then we move on to evaluating the saddle and we're looking at whether the saddle tree matches the shoulder angle is the saddle tree wide enough to accommodate a moving scapula? So we spoke about this earlier and we're looking here at whether the side panels are flush with the shoulder. We want to check that the tree points are parallel to the shoulder angle. If the angle is wrong, then the horse will develop a hollow back. So in the photo on the left, the red line denotes the pitch of the shoulder and the blue line denotes the pitch of, denotes the, pitch of the saddle. And we can see that they don't match and ideally they should match because this saddle doesn't have enough clearance at the top for the scapula to rotate back as the horse moves his leg forward. So the, the saddle tree takes into account the width of the shoulders, not the withers. And if the tree points of the saddle are not wide enough, then the shoulder will not be able to come through, which will restrict the movement and cause issues. So the saddle on the far right is obviously too tight. There's no room in there. Uh, if you try to run your hand down, it will be blocked the whole way. You can clearly see that it's sitting quite tight. The saddle second from the left, you can see we've got a little bit of room to move in there. Um, and that clearly this person in the next photo, which isn't me, I think it's a client, can run their whole hand straight down. So this, the, saddle in, the two saddles in the middle are ideal for this particular horse. And then we look at the saddle with a rider in it. He, that, that's me in the green singlet. <laughs> of course I had to use a perfect example of me. <laughs> so we add the rider and we look at the same things as what we did in step three, but with the rider mounted. We look at how the rider is balanced because an unbalanced, uncomfortable rider will affect the horse. We watch the rider ride in the saddle. We watch the movement of the saddle. We watch the movement and balance of the rider. Is the rider the rider should be sitting with the head, shoulder, hip and heel in line. And we watch the horse to see changes in his attitude. So once they've climbed on board, they might look fantastic and, and dead straight, but is the rider and the saddle, are they all still balanced once the horse is moving? So the one on the left, we can see she's dropped the right hip and that has made her drop the right shoulder and she's tilted to the right. The one in the green singlet is me and of course I am dead straight and evenly balanced. <laughs> and then the rider on the other side, we can see her hips are clearly at different heights and she's, tilt she's dropped her left hip and she's tilting to the right. Um, and then the photo on the far right, just a little moment please. Okay, so we can see this is the same rider and she's leaning to the left. We can see the left uh, foot is lower than the right foot the left knee is lower than the right knee, the left hip is lower than the right hip, and the left shoulder is maybe a touch lower than the right shoulder, but she's pretty even through the shoulders, she's more just uh, crooked through the hips and the lower limbs. So this rider, 
she she's she's sitting up nice and straight, but she's not her own musculature is letting her drop her left hip. So even though you think you are sitting up straight with perfect posture, if you have an injury or if, if you're uh, weak, weaker on one side of your body than the other, chances are you might be dropping to one side and you're not aware of it. <laughs> oh, Louise is just having a giggle because she's read the shirt of the rider on the far left. It's <laughs> Will you please put me back on my horse? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. If you can read this, can you please put me back on my horse? <laughs> Very adequate, given it was for rider biomechanics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So, improving saddle fit. So, if you've looked at your saddle and you think it fits okay, but it's not perfect, how can we improve it? Now, there's a caveat to this because sometimes a saddle regardless of what we do to it or put under it or how we change it, it's still just not going to fit. An example is if it is physically too long for the horse's back. So a massive uh, western saddle on a short-backed quarter horse is a very good example of this. Uh, being a body worker, I also come across a lot of people who can't afford to buy a new saddle, nor do they want to buy an expensive Second, or, or they might want to buy a, an expensive second-hand saddle, so they can't afford to buy an expensive brand new saddle and get it fitted, so they look for second-hand options. Um, so provided the saddle that you're looking at fits within the weight-bearing area of your horse's back, then there are things that we can do to improve the way it fits. So if it's bridging, but it's still within the weight-bearing area, then sometimes we can um, adjust the saddle flocking or put something underneath it to help improve the fit of the saddle and the comfort of your horse. Um, but of course the caveat goes along with the, the things we've spoken about earlier is does the saddle fit in the weight bearing area? If it's outside of that then no amount of shimming or altering or adjusting is going to make the saddle fit. Um, so shimming involves putting packing into the saddle itself or putting a pad, shims, underneath the saddle on top of the saddle pad. There are many different types of saddle solutions available. There's riser pads, gel pads, there's different brands, thin line, Cavallo, etc. Um, but being a body worker, I have yet to find one that's effective at improving the fit of the saddle. So there's plenty of pads out there and options to improve the comfort of your horse, but I have yet to find one that actually changes or improves the fit of the saddle itself. So I then went on a worldwide hunt to find the best shimming material, something that I could confidently recommend to my bodywork clients. So the material that I use is manufactured in the States and it's used for really demanding seating conditions like wheelchairs, military aircraft, motorcycle seats, race car seats, etc. Um, I buy the foam in in sheets and then I hand cut and hand bevel shims and pads to suit my clients. So this Improving saddle fit can only be done, I can't stress this enough, it can only be done if the saddle fits within the weight bearing area of the horse. So everything we've spoken about so far is paramount if you want to improve the fit of your saddle. If you, if you go through the steps we've spoken about but the saddle hangs past the last rib or it's not wide enough through the tree or it's, it's too narrow through the channel, then regardless of what you do, it's still not going to fit your horse properly. So these particular pads and shims that I make, uh, they provide high impact energy absor absorption but they have soft pressure properties. It's the same foam that Skeeto use if anyone knows of Skeeto products. It's uh, open cell so it maximizes airflow which reduces heat buildup and it's, all, it's, a memory, it's got memory foam properties that allow it to uniformly distribute and absorb impact energy for pressure relief. So I was sold on this product because I took Am I allowed to say brand names? Probably not, yeah? I can, Louise is saying I can. I spent something ridiculous, like $350 on a, a thin line saddle pad, which was supposed to be a, a saddle fit solution. And when I put a pen underneath it and then lean on it, I could feel the pen. And then I got the foam and I put the pen underneath this foam and I leant on it and I couldn't feel the pen. And so that is what prompted me to use this foam to improve saddle fit because it, it's really good at uniformly distributing and absorbing impact. So 
the foam absorbs 90% of normal use impact energy, which greatly reduces fatigue caused by sudden jolts or constant vibration, and I thought this would be perfect on the horse's back. It's also got naturally low toxicity levels, and it's made with 33 to 36, because we're being very specific, percent natural plant-based ingredients. So, um, it also, the other thing I really like about this foam is that I can buy it in medium, medium firm and firm densities and we can get it in quarter inch, half inch and three quarter inch thicknesses. So I can really use the foam to tailor what we need to improve with the specific saddle and horse combination. So there are some saddles that um, they're, if they fit within the weight bearing area but the balance isn't right. So then I'll put three quarter foam at the front and maybe one quarter foam, uh, half, sorry, quarter inch foam at the back and then that will give me a little bit more lift at the front while not really adding too much lift to the back which means I can improve the balance of the saddle. And the densities, medium is quite soft, medium firm is the most popular and firm is really good to use if I need, if the saddle fits but I just need more height. So if the saddle fits but I've only got two fingers over the withers then that's when I need a lot more lift so that we can get that clearance and so that's when I'll use the firm density and a three quarter inch foam. So uh, this, there's a bit of a, a, an art to improving saddle fit and out of all of the products that are on the market, this, is, this foam is the best I've found. It's just a shame that it's made in America and I have to import it and I don't really know anyone that stocks it. I tried to find it in Australia and I couldn't. They told me they didn't have any stockists in Australia which is terribly sad because it's brilliant for saddle fit. It's helped a lot of horses. Um, but I can't stress enough that you can only improve saddle fit if your saddle fits within the weight bearing area currently and it just needs tweaking. Uh, if it's physically too long or too narrow or the channel's too narrow or whatever then you really can't fit that particular saddle to your horse comfortably. Okay, so now we're just going to go on to the little more information slide. This is our last one. If you wanted more information on saddle fit, equine assessment, muscle therapy and rehab for your horse, check out my website. I also have an online shop there where I've listed a little bit more information about the foam and the shims and the pads. Um, if you wanted to order them but you're not sure what density or thickness you need, then you're welcome to have, give me a call and have a chat or flick me an email. Photos are helpful too of your horse's back and your saddle. Um, alternatively, if you're in the area, I can always come out and have a look at it for you. Um, so hopefully this webinar was interesting and uh, hopefully you learnt something from it. And I'd like to thank Louise and Horsebone and exclusively Equine Vets for having me along. And I'm going to pass back to Louise and we'll open up for questions, I think. Thank you, everybody. So if anyone does have any questions, just type them away and um, we will get to them. Um, I think the biggest thing um, from this uh, webinar is the fact that you can't, um, you know, you've got to have the foundations there. We are constantly um, having clients that it's just a completely wrong saddle. And I, I can understand that you don't want to go out and fork out for a new saddle or anything like that, but a lot of the time you are just wasting your money um, dealing with what you've got. Um, the only time I don't think saddle fit is really that important is when you're a rider like me, you might get on your horse once every six months and you go for about a half hour ride. Um, then you can potentially deal with what you've got. But if you're riding your horse constantly or continually, um, it is so important to have them comfortable and, and, um, and happy and not just go and buy you know, the, the western saddle that looks really great because it's got bling and, and, um, and uh, engraving in it and it just looks perfect. It, it might feel good on your bum but it feels terrible on the horse. So um, it is so important saddle fitting um, and it's not something that you have to get someone out to do, just the basics that Kate has run over there um, are things that they're, you know, if everyone goes out tomorrow and looks at their saddle, you might go, oh bugger. Um, just, <laughs> just, just looking at the basics. Um, now that it's been pointed out to you, you might maybe don't do it tomorrow. Wait and save up until you can afford a new saddle, and then do it. Um, but it is so important um, for your horse's movement and, and happiness. We're we're often getting phone calls where um, the, the they're ringing 
the vet to figure out what the behavioural issue is, um, and you get out there and you know you know they start biting when the the person girths up, and you can see that they've got girth galls, and um, you know there's massive problems, and it's often hard to just be diplomatic and say, look, it's your saddle. Um, you know, no, your horse doesn't have ulcers. It's clearly the fact that it doesn't want you on its back because the saddle's hurting. So, um, yeah, so that's um, that's a, a, yeah, a big problem. So, so if anyone's got any questions, type them in the question box for me, and we will. Must have been really thorough. Yeah, Kate must have been really thorough because we haven't got any questions. So, I'll just give you a few more seconds there and we shall see if anyone has any questions. So yes, I'm a shocker, I got a hand-me-down saddle that my horse has to tolerate but the only the only positive about my saddle, I have to admit I haven't checked the, the fitting, um, I always make sure that the wither is clear though and the scapula. Um, can move, but um, I don't often check the sweat spots or anything when I get off her purely because it's only once every six months that I tend to get on her. So it's about all I have time for at the moment. So um, yeah, look, we don't seem to have any questions coming through. So um, I'm hoping that everyone <laughs> can still hear us and and we haven't got any sound issues like we did last time. Um, but I will, I will leave it there, we will sign off, but like I said, if anyone does have any questions, um, Kate is more than happy to, um, if you just email her directly, she's more than happy to help you out um, or shoot a um, email through to me and I can help you. Oh, hang on, we have a question. Um, spots, oh, hang on. Um, so my horse, my horse rides well but has dry spots, um, tried different pads with no success. Um, so, Clavin, I'll just pass you back to Kate um, and she can um, just go over um, the, the dry spots for you. Hello again. So, dry spots, if they're where the stirrup bars are, then they're not critical. Um, the stirrup bars, because they're metal, whereas the rest of the saddle around it is leather and flocking, then they can leave a little pressure point. Um, Usually when I see dry spots where the stirrup bars are, then it, it's not so much of an issue and you can usually improve that by putting a nice pad underneath or some memory foam. Um, if the dry spots are higher up, like directly below the withers or under the seat of the saddle at the back, then that would indicate a saddle that doesn't fit. So um, you can have the saddle reflocked and see if that makes a difference. You can look at your horse and his muscle development and see if the saddle is shifting in a way that it shouldn't based on him having one shoulder bigger than the other. Or you can look at using a shim underneath or a pad underneath to even out any pressure points that you've got in your saddle. Usually dry patches are indicative of too much or not enough pressure and they can be resolved by um, leveling out the flocking. If in line with the stirrup bars. Oh, they're in, yep. sorry, Louise has just told me that yes, they are in line with the stirrup bars. Yeah, so in that case, it's um, minor concern. The stirrup bars will often generate little pressure points of their own and there's nothing that we can do to avoid that because the stirrups have to clip onto something secure, so metal, um, and we can't stitch them in because we need to be able to adjust them. So. Um, having a little pressure point over the stirrup bar isn't that big a deal. You can um, even out the pressure by putting a pad underneath, which will help, um, but it's pretty common and it's usually not anything to be too concerned about. It's, it's a different sort of pressure to something that's higher up in the weight bearing area. Hopefully that's answered it. Yeah, Louise is nodding. Yeah, cool. Oh, I think so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I might pass you back to Louise. Thank you for the question, Kevin. Um, okay, well, I think that that's all the questions that we have. Kate's done a very good job covering everything there. I've learned a few uh, few new things tonight, so um, 
yeah okay well we will leave you um, with it and I look forward to talking to you next month and just um, I've been flat out with breeding season um, uh, just recently and I promise to get more cases on um, our little uh, closed Facebook group and we'll have a lot more discussion so uh, I will have that up by um, mid next week and then our article on um, worming vaccinations and uh, ulcers will be up next week also so um, keep your eye out for that uh, white paper and I will talk to you all soon. Thanks for that. Bye.